I'm going to get tired of holding my Bible. So we'll be in, uh, we'll open up in Hebrews 10 tonight. Or tap your way there. Father God, we thank you for this evening, Lord, um, that we're still able to gather together in your name um, to learn about you, to worship you, and to have fellowship with each other. Um, we just pray um, in the next 45 minutes or for however long we have that um, we hear your spirit working through us, Lord, um, that we hear your word as you've written it um, so that we can take it to heart, Lord, um, and have a pure heart um, good for you um, so that we can do the works that you've set on, upon our hearts. Um, so I just ask that you be with me and the uh, rest of CBF, Lord, and um, just bless your night and hope to be, be a great time in the Word. Amen. All right. Um, so those of you that don't, meet, don't know me too well, um, I'm Christopher Bove, and uh, I was born back in Pennsylvania to my two parents back there. Hi, guys. And... Um, I had the blessing of being uh, raised in a Christian home, um, so since I was a young boy, um, I was raised uh, according to God's truth and um, His precepts, so I accepted Christ at a young age um, when I was old enough to understand, and uh, I know it had a definite impact on uh, the change of my life um, going, going forward. Um, that being said, I definitely struggled in middle school and high school with sin, and um, it really didn't, I didn't see the biggest spiritual change in my life um, until we went uh, to church um, back in ninth grade. Uh, they were starting Genesis when we visited, and I said, oh, sounds great, we'll stay until they finish Genesis up. And uh, a year later, um, we were like, yeah, I guess we'll stay here. Um, so what I learned there is um, just taking God's word for what it is and uh, covering each and every bit of it, even if it's a hard truth to hear. Um, and knowing his word is the way out of temptation and out of sin um, so you can put to death the old man and put on the new man of Christ um, so just like Jesus is in the desert tempted by Satan um, he says it is written it is written it is written um, so I encourage you um, you know spend time in the word daily um, and then you can hide those truths in your heart and then when temptation hits um, you can be ready for it with your sword and uh, that's the way out of uh, <laughs> all of the temptations we'll be faced with, um, God won't try you beyond what you can bear. Um, and most of the time we're holding on to these fleshly things. We're like, oh, but this is, I could just have one little pleasure in life, right? And uh, most of the time, once you let go, um, God is trying to get you to get let go because he wants to give you something better. Um, so, you know, do that. Trust in God um, that he has your best um, you know, it says you'll, he'll give you the desires of your heart. That being said, remember Joseph, right? Um, thrown into the pit by his brothers, uh, going from the favorite son to the bottom of the pit, sold into slavery. But then he rises up in Potiphar's house, and uh, you, know, he, you could be sure he was praising God. And then uh, next thing he knows it, he's, um, you know, thrown into prison unrightfully by um, Potiphar's wife, right? And things are looking down again. And, uh, but he's praying, God works in him. Uh, you know, becomes head, you know, works with the jailer, so to speak, and uh, works in the, the two men's lives, and then he's in charge of the whole kingdom of Egypt. So, what I'll, what I'll say is, uh, you know, it, your spiritual journey is going to be rocky. Uh, you'll be climbing up some hills, hitting some valleys, and most of the time you'll climb to the next hill just to see what the valley is, and the next hill, and that's pretty much all you can see. Um, so just say trust in God and uh, he'll work it out and uh, definitely encourage each other, um, be together because um, th this group will nurture you throughout your college. You'll face some difficult times but fall back on them and uh, fall back on God and uh, you'll, you'll do just fine. <laughs> um, so hopefully having the word out is making you hungry and you don't want me to talk anymore. Um, so why do we choose Hebrews tonight? Um, so, uh, who goes to BBC? Well, who's gone to BBC at some point? Okay. So, if you, if you don't know, we, we've been in uh, Hebrews uh, for two years, and uh, we might have just finished chapter two. Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, hopefully, we'll go a little bit faster tonight. Um, and then, when I was working at MIT Lincoln Laboratory last summer, um, we also, the Bible study there actually went through Hebrews, uh, but we did it in 13 weeks, but that's okay. Um, and 
And this term, uh, if you don't know, uh, we're looking at truths we can take and lessons learned from the Old Testament. And uh, Hebrews is one of the books, if you go through it, um, if your Bible shows like bold-faced or all caps, that means it's quoting from something, and he Hebrews is full of it. Um, so they're all quoting the Old Testament. Um, so that being said, Hebrews is a book written to... Hebrews, right. So, yeah, I know, it's crazy. Um, Galatians must have written to the Galatians, I guess. So, um, so the, these are Jews that... Um, are, we, we, like, we could say they're completed Jews, right? Because they followed the Old Testament other than they accepted Christ, right? Uh, so these are the believers. So um, let's read 10.32 real quick um, to see what they're going through. But remember the former days when after being enlightened, you endured a great conflict of sufferings, partly by being made a public spectacle through reproaches and tribulations, and partly by becoming sharers with those who were so treated. So both personal tribulation and then sharing um, as one body the tribulation of others. For you showed sympathy to the prisoners and accepted joyfully the seizure of your property, knowing that you have for yourselves a better possession and a lasting one. So if you were a Jew at that time, coming to Christ meant rejecting your synagogue. The synagogue would no longer allow you in there. If you have the synagogue, um, it's going to be hard to trade and have fellowship um, with your community. Um, they'll seize your property as we learn. So these are um, some Hebrews that are really struggling um, taking on Christ. They might be dealing with questions like, how do you know that Jesus is really you know, suitable or acceptable um, to atone for your sin? Um, how do you know you don't need the priest still? Why, are, you know, why aren't you hanging out at the synagogue as much? Um, so these are all things that they're dealing with. Um, turn to chapter 13 real quick. Um, so we know who it was written to. So the question comes up, who wrote it? Anyone? It's unknown. Very good, Jacob Gold Star. Um, but we do know that they like long letters. Um, so if we read verse 22, But I urge you, brethren, bear with this word of exhortation, for I have written to you brief, briefly, after 13 chapters, take notice that our brother Timothy has been released, with whom, if he comes soon, I will see you. Greet all your leaders and all the saints, those from Italy greet you. Grace be with you all. Um, so that you can pick out a couple other uh, pieces of information about the author, but it seems like um, he wasn't a direct um, disciple of Christ, um, but it seems like he says he heard the word by those who heard it from Christ, so it sounds like he's second um, witness, I guess that is. Um, so you can think about that a little bit more. And we just read why it was written. Um, so this is a word of exhortation, um, and that's periclesis in the Greek from the root word perikleo, <laughs> Great. What does that mean? Um, so parakleo comes from a word meaning to teach or speak. And then paraklesis is an exhortation, a teaching. Um, so when, when you say that, we, we like to say it's um, you're urging someone to do something. Um, so if you go through Hebrews, um, the first 10 chapters about um, are giving the reader a lot of information and truth. And then as, as you get all these truths, um, the author is able to start telling you, hey, there's some things you should be doing. Um, so you guys might, uh, well, it's not fortuitous, but I guess providentially, um, you might not get as many exhortations tonight, maybe a little bit. Um, but So you could go home and study it for yourselves. And then the last thing is when. Um, we'll see a couple of verses tonight which make it seem like that this book was written before the temple fell. Anyone know when the temple was destroyed? No. Yep, so about 70 AD. Yep, when uh, the Romans took over Jerusalem and destroyed the temple as Christ prophesied, um, not one stone will be left upon another. Um, so that's why we think this book is probably written before 70 AD. Um, but we'll find out when we get to heaven. Um, so with that, we're going to go back to chapter 8 real quick. Um, chapter 9 is the main target if you need that, um, but we're going to read 8 real quick um, to pick up some truths about the covenant. And this is like the Spark Notes version, because if you notice, it says now the main point. So we're, we're getting there. Now the main point in what has been said is this. We have such a high priest who has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heavens, that being Christ, a minister in the sanctuary and in the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched, not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices, so it is necessary that this high priest also have something to offer. Now, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are those who offer the gifts according to the law. Again, so this seems like they're 
currently doing the temple sacrifices, who serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things, just as Moses was warned by God when he was about to erect the tabernacle. For see, he says, that you make all things according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain. Exodus 25. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry by as much as he is also the mediator of a better covenant, which has been enacted on better promises. For if the first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion sought for a second. We'll need this soon. For finding fault with them, he says, Behold, days are coming, says the Lord, when I will effect a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand. It's kind of interesting he took them by the hand. To lead them out of the hand, land of Egypt, for they did not continue in my covenant, and I did not care for them, says the Lord, because they did not continue in, their, in his covenant. For this is the covenant, new one, that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws into their minds, and I will write them on their hearts, and I will be with their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach everyone his fellow citizen, and everyone his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all will know me, from the least to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. That was all from Jeremiah 31, if you're curious. Uh, when he said a new covenant... He has made the first obsolete, but whatever is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to disappear. So that should already be of some comfort to those who are a little anxious. Do I still need to be following the old covenant, right? So now we're told that, nope, that one you don't need anymore. The Lord was planning to replace that one anyway. So now we get to chapter 9. Now even the first covenant had regulations of divine worship in the earthly sanctuary. So now that makes sense. He's saying now even the first. We know it was flawed, but it... He even still had these things. <clears throat> so now we're going into Tabernacle 101. Um, For there was a tabernacle prepared, the outer one, in which were the lampstand and the table and the sacred bread. This is called the holy place. Behind the second veil, there was a tabernacle, which is called the Holy of Holies, having a golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden jar holding the manna and Aaron's rod which budded, and the tables of the covenant. And above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. But of these things we cannot now speak in detail. All right, so uh, anyone see what's on the back of this? It's kind of funny. No. Dynamics of an open chain manipulator. Um, so that's not what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, so if you do this real quick, this will help us understand What's going on? Anyone know what's at the east of the uh, tabernacle? We just read it. <laughs> at the fence. I think we said it, right? It's like the Oh, actually, I guess we didn't say it. <laughs> All right. Good. That was a good one, though. All right. So there's actually a gate here. Just one gate into it. And then we have the tent of meeting, which we were just talking about. That's too big. All right, and then you just mentioned the veil, right, which is in there. And then over here, with four horns, we have the altar. And this is what you tie the sacrifice down to. Let me get the poles right. Let me go this way. And then we have the brazen laver, which is the uh, body of water the priests wash in. Right, so this is, well, you'll remember. And then in the Holy of Holies... We have the table of showbread, right? Twelve loaves, one for each tribe of Israel. We have the lampstand. I'm not an artist. Watch out. That's not a tree. Tree of life comes later. And then we have the altar of incense here. And then what's in the Holy of Holies? Ark of the Covenant. All right. It's not in a warehouse somewhere in the U.S. for the Indiana Jones fans. <laughs> and uh, what's on the Ark of the Covenant? Cherubim. We have the cherubim, right? What, well, there's something bigger, though. Anyone know? The mercy, the mercy seat. seat. Yep. So uh, we'll look at this later, but there's the glory of God sitting on the mercy seat, right? When the t tabernacle was being ministered with. All right. So everyone got that? Oh, one more thing. You have to get in some way, right? Again, we have another there. So it's interesting, there's one way to get to God, and uh, I'm sure the verse comes to mind, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me, right? 
Um, so that's interesting. God hides, uh, doesn't hide it, but he puts truth all throughout his word. Um, so there we go. Um, so real quick, we mentioned the veil before. That's of interest. So let's check out uh, 619, chapter 619. This hope we have as an anchor for the soul, of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast, and one which enters within the veil, where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. So Jesus has entered as a forerunner through us, through the veil, right? So a forerunner is one who goes before you, and then we follow, right? Um, who knows Melchizedek? Open book quiz two. Jacob? He's a priest from Abraham's time who was uh, well regarded as a man of faith. Yeah, and uh, to, it's easy. If you, if you see seven, it's right there. Yeah, David? It's also a king. It's also a king. Yeah, so let's go check that out. So chapter seven... Okay, this is great. He just puts it right here so we don't have to go all the way back to Genesis 14. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham as he was returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. It's an interesting story. To whom also Abraham appointed a tenth part of all the spoils was first of all by the translation of his name, king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, which is king of peace. Oh, that's pretty cool. Without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, he remains a priest perpetually. So they're setting up a parallel between Melchizedek and the things we just learned there, and then Christ. So I think you can connect a lot of the dots yourself. Um, but that's what we had to learn about the veil. So let's go back to our text, Hebrews 9. And we're, we'll be in verse 6 now. Now when these things have been so prepared, the priests are continually entering the outer tabernacle, performing the divine worship. But into the second, only the high priest enters once a year, not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the sins excuse me, of the people committed in ignorance. When is that? What day is that? Day of Atonement? Yep, what do the Jews call it? Close. Yom Kippur. Good. Another gold star. You'll run out of room soon. Um, so let's go check it out. Leviticus chapter 16. Leviticus chapter 16. You can find a buddy if you don't have a Bible. Um, should have brought an extra one. And you'll be wishing you had tabs by the end of tonight. Now the Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron when they had approached the presence of the Lord and died. The Lord said to Moses, now before we start, uh, what we wanted to look for, don't try to catch every detail in here. Um, a lot of the Hebrew writing will give you a general idea of what's going on. So they'll say that the bull sacrificed, and then you read, and then they slaughtered the bull, and you're like, the bull was sacrificed. Where did the second bull come from? So don't get too confused on it, but catch as much as you can as we go through here, and that'll help in the next 10 or so verses we read back in Hebrews. Cool? All right. Tell your brother Aaron that he shall not enter at any time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat. Uh, mercy is there literally propitiation. That's interesting. Which is on the ark or he will die for I will appear in the cloud over the mercy seat. Um, so that, that's called the Shekinah glory of God. Um, but you could do a whole study on that. Aaron shall enter the holy place with this, with a bull for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. He shall put on the holy linen tunic, and the linen undergarments shall be next to his body, and he shall be girded with the linen sash and attired with a linen turban. These are holy garments. Then he shall bathe his body in water in the lazen, and put them on. He shall take from the congregation of the sons of Israel two male goats for sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. Then Aaron shall offer the bull for the sin offering, which is for himself, that he may make atonement for himself and for his household. He shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tent of meeting, second door. Aaron shall cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. Then Aaron shall offer the goat on which the lot for the Lord fell and make it a sin offering. It's not, it's not there yet. We'll get to it. But the goat on which the lot for the scapegoat fell shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement um, upon it, to send it into the wilderness as a scapegoat. Again, just giving you the quick summary before we get into the detail. Then Aaron shall make the... Uh, <clears throat> Then Aaron shall offer the bull of the sin offering, which is for himself, and make atonement for himself and for his household. And he shall slaughter the bull of the sin offering, which is for himself. He shall take a fire pan full of coals of fire from upon the altar before the Lord, and two handfuls of finely ground sweet incense, and bring it inside the veil. 
He shall put the incense on the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is on the ark of the testimony, otherwise he will die. Um, if you read earlier, the uh, priest had little uh, metal like bells um, on his tunic or his apron. And according to Jewish tradition, um, when the priest would go into the Holy of Holies on Yom Kippur, you would hear the bells as he's walking through the temple, right? They would tie a rope onto him before they went into the temple. Because then you hear the ting, 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 thud. No more bells. <laughs> Pull him out. Um, he's dead. So, just an interesting note there. Um, <clears throat> Moreover, he shall take some of the blood of the bull and sprinkle it with his finger on the mercy seat on the east side. Also in front of the mercy seat, he shall sprinkle some of the blood with his finger seven times. Then he shall slaughter the goat of the sin offering, which is for the people, and bring its blood inside the veil, and do it and do with its blood as he did with the blood of the bull, which covered his sin, and sprinkle it on the mercy seat and in front of the mercy seat. He shall make atonement for the holy place because of the impurities of the sons of Israel and because of their transgressions in regard to all their sins. Thus he shall do for the tent of meeting which abides with them in the midst of their impurities. When he goes in to make atonement for the holy place, no one shall be in the tent of meeting until he comes out. He may make atonement for himself and for his household and for all the assembly. Then he shall go out to the altar that is before the Lord and make atonement for it, and shall take some of the blood of the bull and of the blood of the goat, and put it on the horns of the altar on all sides. With his finger he shall sprinkle some of the blood on it seven times and cleanse it, and from the impurities of the sons of Israel consecrate it. When he finishes atoning for the holy place in the tent of meeting and the altar, he shall offer the live goat. Then Aaron shall lay both of his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it, all the iniquities of the sons of Israel and all their transgressions in regard to their, all their sins. And he shall lay them on the head of the goat and send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a man who stands in readiness. The goat shall bear on itself all their iniquities to solitary lands and he shall release the goat into the wilderness. Almost done. Then Aaron shall come into the tent of meeting and take off the linen garments which he uh, put on when he went into the holy place and shall leave them here. He shall bathe his body with water in a holy place because he's covered in blood and put on his clothes, good note, and come forth and offer his burden offering and the burnt offering of the people and make atonement for himself and for the people. Then he shall offer it up and uh, offer up and smoke the fat of the sin offering on the altar. The one who released the goat shall wash. All right. But the bull of the sin offering and the goat of the sin offering whose blood was brought in to make atonement in the holy place shall be taken outside the camp and they shall burn their hides, their flesh, and their refuse in the fire. If you remember, Jesus goes outside of the city and that's where he's put on the cross. Uh, there shall be a permanent statute, seventh month, tenth day of the month. Humble, you'll, humble your souls and not do any work. And on this day, atonement shall be made for you to cleanse you. You will be clean from all your sins before the Lord. And uh, verse 34, and then we're done here. Now you shall have this as a permanent statute to make atonement for the sons of Israel for all their sins once every year. And just as the Lord had commanded Moses, so he did. All right. There's a lot of info, but hopefully you picked up some of it. Now, when we hit Hebrews, maybe some of that will come back to life. <clears throat> so, verse, uh, chapter 9, verse, uh, do, 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 lost myself. Hang on, it's coming back. Oh, here we go, verse 7. But into the second, only the high priest enters once a year, not without taking blood, we just read about it, which he offers for himself and for the sins of the people committed in ignorance. Job also did a similar thing, if you read that story, for his sons and daughters. The Holy Spirit is signifying this, that the way into the holy place has not yet been disclosed while the outer tabernacle is still standing, which is a symbol for the present time. Accordingly, both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make the worshiper perfect in conscience, since they relate only to food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until a time of reformation. Uh, hmm. Anyone ever heard 10-4 on a radio? What does temp four mean? Understood. Yeah, understood. Yes, I understood your message. So let's turn to temp four. <laughs> for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, uh, well, we'll get to that later. All right. So impossible there is adineti uh, tias, and it, it, it does mean impossible. Sorry, had to give it to you. Um, so, we just learned that. Ever been to 7-Eleven? Anyone? Yeah, three of you? Okay, let's go to 7-Eleven. Now, if perfection was through the Levitical priesthood, 
Sorry, I'll wait a little bit if you're tapping. I know it's slower. All right. Now, if perfection was through the Levitical priesthood, for on the basis of it the people received the law, what further need was there for another priest to rise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be designated according to the order of Aaron? Right? So, if the Levitical priesthood was good enough, then why did God promise that he's going to blast that covenant away and give you a new covenant by the order of Melchizedek, right? There's something not sufficient with the law, which is what we just read, right? For it is possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins, right? If it was, then they wouldn't have to do this year after year after year, right? So you get the forgiveness of sin, right? From the, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness or remission of sin, right? But it's not enough to actually cleanse you fully because you have to come back and do it again because you're going to keep on sinning, right? Um, so we covered that. Let me, this is where I start losing myself because I get crazy. <clears throat> All right. Good, good. I remembered a lot. It's great. Okay. Yeah, I think we're good. All right, so let's go back to 9-11. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood, he entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Now, what holy place could he be talking about, right? We were just talking about the tabernacle, right? But he's entering one not made with hands, not of this creation. So where is this one? Let's turn to 24 real quick. Same book, just scroll down a bit. For Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor was it that he would offer himself often. So Christ is entering as a forerunner heaven, right? So he's able to, with his blood, the, so the same priests, right, they make the sacrifice, they take the blood to cover themselves, and then they can go into the holy place. Then they can come and bring the offering, the goat, the sin offering for the people, and, um, the, and do likewise, right? So since he's perfect, he doesn't need the bull, right? He doesn't have any sin of his own. So his own sacrifice, through his own blood, he's able to enter for us as a whole uh, forerunner, having attained uh, eternal redemption. For, verse 13, if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer, right, we kind of read about that, right, he goes out and gets the coals and then he comes back in and puts the incense on it, right? Those who have been defiled sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Sorry. A uh, cool thing here, right? We have the blood of Christ through the eternal spirit offered himself Christ without blemish to God the Father. Cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God the Father, right? So you have the Trinity right there. Um, <clears throat> so again, so Hebrews worried about this. Christ is sufficient. With his blood, we're able to go in and you don't need the old covenant anymore. For this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant so that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. For where a covenant is, there must of necessity be the death of the one who made it. For a covenant or a testament is valid only when men are dead, for it is never in force while the one who made it lives. That might seem a little confusing. Let's see why it's what it's there for. Therefore, even the first covenant was not inaugurated without blood. Okay, so that's what the last couple of verses we're talking about. So someone has to die for this new covenant to take effect. And we learn even the first was not inaugurated without blood. So let's see. For when every commandment had been spoken by Moses to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of the calves and the goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people. You can read about this Exodus 24, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God commanded you. And in the same way, he sprinkled both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry with the blood. As Christians in the new covenant, uh, what are God's vessels of ministry? So Walter got it. Us, yeah. Us right? 
Ah, that's kind of interesting, right? So Christ purchased for us with his blood, right? So we too get the sprinkling of his blood, which washes us so that we can be vessels of honor, right? Instead of dishonor to him in his service. That's pretty cool. <clears throat> all right. And according to the law, one may almost say, all things are cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. So you might be like, well, is the almost say all things are cleansed with blood, or is the almost say without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness, right? So turn to Leviticus 17.11, real quick. Exodus, Leviticus 17.11. I can read it for you too, it's short. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood by reason of the life that makes atonement. Therefore I said to the sons of Israel, no person among you may eat blood, nor may any alien who sojourns among you. Um, so it's by the blood that there's an atonement for sin, which is kind of what we've been hearing the whole time because Christ is making this blood atonement for us. So that's pretty cool. It sounds like the author of Hebrews expects us to know the Old Testament, right? In order to draw all these connections. <clears throat> Therefore, it was necessary... I'm not reading this again, am I? Nope. Therefore, it was necessary for the copies of the things in the heavens to be cleansed with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. In the presence of God for us. What's he doing for us in the presence of God? Let's check out 725, back a couple chapters. Therefore, he is also able to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. He's making intercession for us. Let's check this out. Romans 8.27 talks about this too. So let's turn there. Acts, the letter to the Romans, 8.27. All right, I'll read 26 too, because this is important. In the same way, Romans 8, 26, in the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Have you ever been there? You're just like, oh, right? He's interceding for us when we can't even come up with the words to say. Verse 27, and he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Let's skip down to verse 34 real quick. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. All right, so that's pretty cool. So Christ is there in the presence of God interceding for us. The question would be, what's he interceding for us from, right? So, if you're being an intercessor, what's the deal there? All right, so let's turn to Revelation 12.10. Oh, you're killing me. I know. Keep going. Revelation 12.10. Don't worry, we only have like 10 more minutes. So, all right, Revelation 12.10. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power in the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down. He who accuses them before our God day and night. So, if you read Job, um, you see that Satan has access to the throne room of God, right? So I see some nods heading there, right? So we learn in Revelation here that Satan is still in the presence of God accusing us before his throne day and night, right? So right now, because we're all sinning, Kind of like what uh, Satan did with Job, right? Oh, he's just listening to you because you've blessed him, right? Take away his blessings, he'll curse you, right? Um, so Jesus is there interceding for us to God. And Satan is accusing us continually before him. Um, so we'll look at this more later. But for now, let's turn back to 924. <clears throat> Sorry, not 924. We're at... Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. We're at, uh, yeah, 924. Sorry, correct me when I'm wrong. Nor was it that he would offer himself often as the high priest enters the holy place year by year with blood that is not his own. Otherwise, he would have needed to suffer often, yeah, since the foundation of the world. But now once at the consummation of the ages, he has been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And in, inasmuch as it is appointed, literally laid up, for men to die once, 
and after this comes judgment. So Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await him. So verse 27, two quick things we can learn there, right? You have a one in one chance of dying during the rapture, right? And two, something comes after it that's not the end, right? Um, so the question comes up, right? Why does man have to die, right? And uh, if you're thinking about this appointed, um, there's probably a book in here that you've heard read at a funeral, right? Ecclesiastes 3, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Songs of Solomon, Ecclesiastes 3. There is an appointed time for everything, and there is a time for every event, literally delight, <laughs> isn't that delightful, under heaven. So, God is sovereign, right? And there's an appointed time for everything. So there's no such thing as an inky-winky-dink with God. A time to give birth, and a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to uproot what is planted. A time to kill, and a time to heal, a time to tear down, and a time to build up. A time to weep, and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance. A time to throw stones, and a time to gather stones. A time to embrace, and a time to shun embracing. A time to search and a time to give up as lost. A time to keep and a time to throw away. That's for us hoarders out there. A time to tear apart and a time to sew together. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. You might be sitting there thinking, well, golly, if God's so good and gracious, why, does, why are there times like that, right? Um, so the answer is back in Genesis 27. We're going to go Genesis and Revelation in one night. It's exciting, I know. All right, Genesis 2 7. Genesis 2 7. Yep, it exists. There's like 50 more chapters, right? Yeah, something like that. All right. <clears throat> then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being, literally soul. The Lord God planted a garden toward the east in Eden, and there he placed the man whom he had formed. Out of the ground, the Lord God caused to grow every tree that is pleasing to the sight and good for food. No vegetables, right, Mr. Teal? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the tree of life, also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. All right, so you might be thinking, well, what's the tree of life worth? Don't worry, we'll get to it. Let's skip ahead to uh, 2.15 real quick. Then the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. So work was originally part of God's design, but we'll, again, we'll get there. The Lord God, um, again, whenever you see the Lord God here, this is Yahweh or Jehovah Elohim commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may freely eat, <clears throat> but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat from it you will surely die. So we go back up. From any tree of the garden you may freely eat, except the tree of knowledge and good and evil. What one does that include? If you draw your nice little Venn diagrams there, right, do all of your logic. Tree of life, okay, to anyone else with that one? Does that sound right? Okay, cool. Only tree you can't eat from is the tree of knowledge and good and evil, right? So we get the first commandment from God, and then we also get the first punishment for failing to listen to that commandment, right? He says here, the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. In the Hebrew, it's literally die, die. So some Bibles, uh, you might have it says, dying you shall die, right? Um, so either way you translate it, there's a couple different opinions. Um, but let's keep rolling forward. <clears throat> so uh, we're going to skip down to 3 verse 14. 3 14. Um, so you know what happens? The uh, tempted of Satan, or the serpent, and uh, <clears throat> then the big grand pointing contest of all time goes on. And the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you more than all cattle, and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go, and dust you will eat, and all, all the days of your life. All right, sounds like a serpent turning into snake. All right, sure. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, 
in between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise or crush you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. Okay, let's turn to Revelation 12. I know, I love doing this. All right. <clears throat> Revelation 12. Um, it's a little long, but we'll squeeze it in. A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head a cr crown of 12 stars. That kind of sounds like Joseph's dream when he's um, getting the dream about his brothers bowing down to him, right? And then he gets the dream about the sun and the moon also bowing down, and then his dad says, what, you think I and your mother are going to bow down to you too? So that kind of seems like it's describing um, tribes of Israel, right? And she was with child, and she cried out, being in labor and in pain to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads were seven diadems. And his tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven, and threw them to earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, who was about to give birth, so that when she gave birth, he might devour her child. Why could this child be so important? And she gave birth to a son, a male child, who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. Who's that? Jesus, Jesus right? Okay, great Sunday school answer. See, we got it in there. Um, all right, so the, say, uh, the dragon here wants to devour Christ. And we, it, you can study it for yourself, but it seems like this woman represents Israel because of the relationship to Joseph's dream, right? Um, <clears throat> then the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God so that there she would be nourished for 1,260 days, about three and a half years. Don't worry about it. Study Revelation. And there was war in heaven, Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon. The dragon and his angels waged war. Okay, so the, the dragon also has angels. Um, you can look at this later, but uh, some feel that in verse 4, when he swept away a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to earth, um, the angels are sometimes referred to as the stars in heaven. Um, so some feel that he's dragging down with him some angels that he's also convinced to rebel against God. And they're on the earth now, and then this is where we have the demons, right? The fallen angels. And, well, never mind. All right. <clears throat> and the great dragon was, uh, oh, wait, we're doing the war. Okay, yep. And they were not strong enough. That's good news. And there was no longer a place for them found in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. That's literally the inhabited earth. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. <clears throat> so that kind of lines up with what we were talking about earlier. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, we just read this, right? Now the salvation, power, kingdom of our God, and the authority of his Christ have come, for the accuser of her brethren has been thrown down, he who accuses them before our God day and night. All right, so now it's kind of clicking together. And they overcame him, the devil, <clears throat> because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony. And they did not love their life even when faced with death, right? He who loves his life will lose it, right? He who loses his life for my sake will gain it, right? All right, great. For this reason, rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them, woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, knowing that he has only a short time. Um, yeah, we, we can squeeze it in. <clears throat> but when the dragon saw that he was thrown down, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. Okay, so he's chasing after Israel now. This is the future. But the two wings of the great eagle were given to the woman so that she could fly into the wilderness to her place where she was nourished for a time, times and a half a time from the presence of the serpent. Um, we'll skip down to 17 real quick. The dragon was enraged with the woman and went off to make war with the rest of her children who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. All right, so that kind of paints this picture. Um, so people cool with calling the serpent Satan, right? He tempted man. So there's definitely the body of the serpent that probably maybe becomes a snake. And then God's also addressing Satan who possessed the serpent, right? All right. Um, so I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise, crush you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. So Satan bruises Christ on the cross, right? He thinks he's won. He got Christ to die, right? But then Jesus overcame and conquered, right? And eventually, you read in Revelation, Jesus will crush the head of the serpent um, when 
the Satan is finally thrown into the lake of fire. That was, and a lot of people say, well, why would God have hell, right? It wasn't built for people. It was built for the devil and his angels, right? Um, so that kind of um, outlines that real quick. We'll keep going. We want to get to our main point. Remember, why, why does man have to die? Right? Okay. I know. We're getting sidetracked. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth, and in pain you will bring forth children, yet your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. They've lost this equality, right? But we know with God there's no respect to persons, neither, neither male nor female, Greek nor Gentile, right? That's great. Then to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat from it. Here we go. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. Your life is now numbered. But thorns and thistles it will grow for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. That's new. Thorns and thistles, that doesn't sound like trees good for food. By the sweat of your face you will eat bread till you return to the ground, because from it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. <clears throat> so now, dust you shall return, right? Now there's this, oh, that, that sounds new too, but we'll, we'll get there. Maybe, maybe it's not. <clears throat> now the man called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all the living. That seems like an odd place to put that, right? By the way, she, I, uh, she was called Eve. Um, so why is that here? Because we're part of the inheritors, right? You're going, darn, I really wish those weren't my parents, right? Um, but So we're all inheritors with Adam and Eve, and that means we're also just of one race, right? There's no different races um, under God created us all from Adam and Eve. So we're all brothers and sisters descended from Adam and Eve. Um, so, and again, in, in, in the heaven, you know, we're all rejoicing before the throne. Many people of nations, kindreds, tribes, and tongues, right? All of these different people. So that's going to be a beautiful picture. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. Where do you get a leather jacket? Well, we, we have uh, synthetics nowadays, right? Back then, what, where did you get a leather jacket? Killed a you killed a cow, a bear. Yeah, you're, you're a brave man. <laughs> yeah, um, so that's interesting. Okay, so again, we, we don't want to read too much into this, but wouldn't it make sense if God is making garments of skin for Adam and Eve, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin, right? Wouldn't it make sense for the first sin, there is a blood sacrifice here, Adam and Eve have never seen an animal die, right? Um, and here, God is, because you deserve this punishment, because I told you that if you eat from this tree, you will die, right? Um, I, I'm going to kill this animal in your place so that you don't die right now, um, but the curse is still upon you, right? And this is, the, this is what sets up the whole Old Testament, right? Abel and Cain also get the same commandments, right? Um, and we all know the story. So um, this is pretty interesting, and I, and I think this fits into what we've been <clears throat> learning about, right? But it, it wasn't enough, right? They still needed the person who would come and crush Satan on the head, right? Um, and it's interesting, if you read verse 4, um, now the man had relations with, or, I'm sorry, chapter 4, now the man had relations with his wife Eve, and she conceived and gave birth to Cain, and she said, I've gotten a man-child with the help of the Lord. Now, there's a, two different ways you can translate that. Um, you could translate it as man-child with the help of the Lord, right? So the idea is it says, okay, she gave birth to him with the help of the Lord. Okay, so she's recognizing this was painful. She was able to get it through the Lord. Other way you could translate it is, she, I have gotten a man, the Lord. You're going, that, that doesn't make sense. So either way, right? Um, so it's either she's just saying, hey, thank God, or... She thinks that she just gave birth to the one who's going to crush Satan's head. Well, then when we get to heaven, I'm going to ask her that because um, I'm, I'm curious. Eve, what were you saying? Um, so, <clears throat> verse 22, back in Genesis 3, we're almost, almost done. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. And now he might stretch out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out of the Garden of Eden to cultivate the grounds from which he was taken. So he drove the man out, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he stationed the cherubim and the flaming sword, which turned every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. So what did we just learn about the tree of life? It makes you live forever, right? Um, so that is why man is 
destined to die because he rebelled against God. Adam had two choices, right? He could listen to God's commandment or he could listen to what his flesh was telling him, right? And he chose the flesh, right? I was going to make the middle finger there. That was bad. Um, he chose flesh, right? So you might be saying, okay, so that, that explains why man has to die. It's appointed for man to die, right? Um, we know that Adam lived 950 years after that, right? So he didn't die that day. He had many sons and daughters, right? But he did die. He had a body. He had a spirit, right? Adam knew he was Adam. Uh, dog cat lovers think their cats and dogs know that they're, you know, whatever. And uh, you have three, right? The soul, the breathed part, um, God actually breathing life into him, right, is his soul, right? So Adam didn't die in body. Adam was still Adam. He wasn't like, who am I? What is this place? Right? So he had to have died in soul, right? And you say, okay, I, I, I guess I could see that. And that explains why we need to be born again, right? Um, because we're dead in trespasses and sins, now we have to be born again, right? And then, as Paul talks about, we have to, corruptible has to put on incorruptible, so we eventually need a new body too, right? Okay, so you might be saying, great, great, great. All right, what happens to the tree of life, right? So it's there in the garden, angel swinging a sword around. We don't really know. It could have disappeared in the flood. But uh, Revelation 21, this is the la last one we're jumping around in. Um, for sake of time, I'll, I'll skip over a couple verses. 21, verse 1, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her, her husband. All right, tabernacle of God is among men. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will be no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain, all part of the curse. The first things have passed away. All right, um, we're going to skip down to um, 22 in the same chapter. I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm in chapter 22. Sorry about that. Then he showed me, he being an angel, a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb, right? From you will flow waters, living waters, um, messing that one up a bit, in the middle of its street, that's being New Jerusalem, on either side of the river was the tree of life, bearing twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. There will no longer be any curse, and the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his bond servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will no longer be any night. They will not have need of the light of a lamp, nor the light of the sun, because the Lord God will illumine them, and they will reign forever and ever. These words are faithful and true. <clears throat> so, there's a lot more we could cover in here. Um, yeah, I'm going to read it. I'm sorry, I, I can't help myself. Uh, we'll, we'll go verse 12. Um, Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me. Surrender to every man according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter by the gates into the city. Outside are the dogs and the sorcerers and the immoral persons and the murderers and the idolaters and everyone who loves and practices lying. That pretty much covers me, right? Um, I, Jesus, but by the grace of God, right? <clears throat> I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. This is why it's the revelation of who? Jesus Christ, not of John, right? <laughs> John was the messenger, but it's the revelation of Christ, right? Um, to testify to you these things for the churches. All right, we just read that. The spirit and the bride, that's the church, say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who's thirsty, come. Let the one who wishes to take the water of life without cost. I testify to any, everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues which were written in this book. There's lots of them in Revelation. And if anyone takes away the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his part from the tree of life and from the holy city which were written in this book. Who who testifies to these things says, Yes, I am coming quickly. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. Amen. So real quick, we'll finish up our chapter. Um, I encourage you to think about if, if we believe in the story that God's giving us about the future, 
that he's going to restore us um, so that we could be in a right relationship with him again. I encourage you, think about what prevents you from believing the la the, what he first said about it, that he did make it good, very good, um, you know, without death, without pain, suffering. Um, consider it. Uh, he says he's very good. So Christ also having offered once to bear the sins of many will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await him. So first coming, he's offered once to bear the sins of many. Second coming, he comes in power and glory to those who eagerly await him. Um, he comes in power and glory for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await him. So um, my prayer tonight is that we're all um, among that group, um, that we continue steadfastly in his love, um, so that we could be ready for him. He might come at any time, um, but that we're doing his work here um, so that we're without blame um, at his coming. So, Father God, um, we just thank you so much for your word tonight, Lord, um, for showing us that your book, Lord, is really one book. Thank you so much for preserving it through over 4,000 years of war, um, tribulation, um, ideology springing up and springing back down, Lord. Um, you still preserved your word. We know it's accurate and true. Um, and we just thank you that, you know, before we knew you, your word didn't make sense. Um, but through your spirit, you're able to let us understand it and to open up truth for ourselves um, so that we can come to know you further, Lord, um, through your word. Um, so we just ask that you continue to sanctify and edify us, Lord, um, this group CBF. Um, please help us to reach out to the lost ones around us, Lord, and show them how much you love them. Um, like Hebrew, the author of Hebrews quotes, you know, therefore today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as they did. Um, so I just ask, Lord, if there's anyone here um, that's hearing your voice tonight, Lord, let today be the day. They don't know if they'll walk home tonight. Um, Lord, just ask them to cry out to you um, because you can save us. When Adam sinned, um, they hid themselves. You came looking for us. We didn't come looking for you. Um, you are calling out to each and every one of us, Lord. So I just ask and pray that we hear your knock on our hearts, Lord, um, and we just invite you in um, to have fellowship with you. We thank you for everything you've given us, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.